Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Job Accommodation Network's Accommodation and Compliance Audio and Web Training Series. I'm Lisa Mathis. And and hit button 5, or for TTY, call 877-781. That number is 877-781-9403. Second, we plan to answer as many of your questions as we can during the presentation, so please send in your questions at any time during the webcast to our email account, question at askjan.org. Or you can use our question and answer pod located at the bottom of your screen. To use the pod, just type in your question and then submit it to the question queue. Also on the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a file share pod that you can use if you have difficulty viewing the slides or would like to download them. And finally, I want to remind you that at the end of the webcast is an evaluation form that will pop up automatically on your screen in another window. We really appreciate your feedback, so please stay logged on to fill out the evaluation form. Now let's start today's program. Do you ever find yourself puzzled by the gray areas of the ADA? How can you balance competing needs while providing effective accommodations? Finding a solution that works for both the employer and the employee sometimes requires a more robust negotiation. Today we'll talk about some difficult approaches some different approaches so we can take or at least consider when dealing with those not so clear cut accommodation requests. We may see where employees may need more than one accommodation or two employees may have competing accommodation needs and you need to sort out those dueling requests simultaneously. Or we may have to reevaluate accommodations that have stopped working. Today we're going to walk through five JAN examples where JAN consultants were brought in to help provide practical guidance and work through tailored solutions to hopefully result in a successful accommodation implementation. So here on the slide, you'll see Jan's sample interactive process. This is the six steps, which is just a sample flow chart. And practically speaking, having interactive process in place, it streamlines the process to achieve effective accommodations. And having a process in place really just shows a good faith effort. So we want you to use the sample process as the framework for those hairy and challenging requests that we're going to go through today. So as employers, when you're in the weeds and there's a lot of variables that are creating these roadblocks, we just want you to remember to stay on the path and use the interactive process as your foundation. So looking at step one, recognizing accommodation requests, following through to step six of monitoring the accommodation, and hopefully leading to the su successful accommodation. <clears throat> so looking at example one, we have a new hire that wants to bring their service animal and asks their employer where to take the animal out. So the employer is now concerned how the new animal will clean, how the new employee will clean up after their animal and what visitors will think. So the individual is trying to be proactive and asks the employee, be employer before there's a problem. But now the employer is nervous how it's going to play out. They're now concerned for visitors. Does it reflect poorly on business? Is it bad for business? And as an accommodation, uh, the practical guidance here would, you don't want to make this harder than it has to be. So a typical outdoor area in most situations is going to suffice for a service animal. And as long as employees are kind of in charge and have the tools they need to clean up the area, that's going to be uh, a win-win for both parties. But of course, if there is an issue, um, at that point is whenever an employer can kind of engage and address the issue. Oh, I totally agree, Lisa. This is an area where people just tend to make it a lot harder than it absolutely has to be. Right. Um, I've traveled a lot and seen a lot of service animal relief areas. Some of them are just as simple as a little temporary fine in, in like a 
an outdoor graveled area or an outdoor uh, landscaped area. Uh, sometimes conferences that have a lot of attendees who use service animals will just create these temporary spaces. Um, there are also lots of indoor options. If you really have a lot of people who, who use an animal frequently in your area, um, there are really robust options for developing a nice outdoor zone. Uh, companies will help you with the design if it's a huge issue. Uh, people are being weird about a dog in the area. Uh, you can also, from compliance signs, uh, get a sign that says service animal relief area so that people will not hassle those who are using that zone. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, but what if it's not that clear cut? So now what if a landlord seems to be interfering? Uh, so we see this all the time, that employers are renting these spaces, renting these buildings to conduct business. So now they have to take the landlord's or opinions into consideration. Luckily for us, the, there is formal EEOC guidance, specifically number 46 in the Reasonable Accommodation Undue Hardship Guidance, that kind of addresses landlord interference and that kind of triangle of the employee, employer, and landlord. Uh, but of course, it's important to address the employer obligation to accommodate in these employment leases, um, building leases in these contracts, kind of before an instance would arise. It's, that's why it's good to work out these leases and contracts. And because sometimes there is a shared obligation to accommodate, the landlord may have an obligation for public access versus the employer to employee obligation. So looking at the example, uh, the landlord's prohibiting the service animal from going around their building, and now it's winter time, and the relief area is across an icy parking lot. So that is now posing an issue. Yeah, this when this example came up um, in a Jan call, I really felt a lot of concern for the service animal user because, uh, first of all, uh, depending on the type of service the animal is performing, it might be very challenging for somebody to navigate a parking lot um, that large in really inclement weather. If it's a balanced dog, mm -hmm. um, I, I can see the potential for slipping. Um, if it's uh, a support animal for someone who's you know anxious about the weather, that could be a big challenge. Right. Uh, and for a guide dog, um, the handler might not have um, a, a good way to detect, say, black ice. Um, and, you know, we talk about sometimes, you know, clearing a path to the area that's acceptable and putting down salt and so forth, um, which can help with traction, uh, but that salt can also have an impact on the animal's paws. So there is really a lot to unpack when you're considering an issue like this, and I think it makes a lot of sense to decide which battle do you want to fight, uh, do you want to try to work it out in a reasonable way, uh, or do you want to wait for the workers' comp claim to roll in? <laughs> Right. There's just a lot of potential for things to go wrong here. Oh, I believe it. <clears throat> so I mentioned for the targeted solution, um, going back to those contracts, here in this specific example, it was a federal employer, so we did recommend talk to GSA, the General Service Administration, get the information you need from them. Um, so let's say that the landlord is correct in prohibiting it around that area, that he's within his right to do that. Um, you mentioned clearing a path, using salt. A simple DIY could just be using the back of the building, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Public doesn't have to um, be impacted whatsoever. So these just practical solutions don't make it harder than it has to be. Right, and people who uh, have service animals often receive specialized training in the animal's care and how to make sure that the animal's biological needs don't impact others unnecessarily. Uh, and uh, one thing that uh, I sometimes talk about is if an employer is saying, oh, we don't want them to use um, the area near the entrance uh, because the landlord's prohibiting it, well, I bet the landlord didn't think to outlaw indoor relief areas. And those <laughs> do exist. Right. Yes. I think we talk about that on the next slide. We sure do. Uh, so one of the things that uh, that we talk about in this particular case that we talk about in a lot of cases uh, is the potential for creating uh, a relief area. Uh, and products are available to create temporary indoor relief areas. Um, there's also products that can help improve traction when walking on ice. I think it's going to be case by case whether those are effective. Uh, but just as an example, 
Um, LL Bean is a company that carries a lot of devices that you can put onto shoes or boots to help improve your traction. Uh, the Stable Icer is one such example. But when you're trying to figure out if it's going to be effective, you need to consider you know, the needs and abilities of the individual uh, and also whether you're going to have them put those on and, and take those off every time uh, they need to leave the building and the impact it's going to have on your flowing and all sorts of things like that. It might be a lot more practical um, just to find an area near the building that meets everybody's needs. Uh, but if you do have either a, a temporary or long-term need for an indoor area, there are a couple of companies that specialize in this kind of thing. One is Doggy Lawn, uh, and for about $50 per shipment, uh, you can get an indoor relief area that uh, has grass and is disposable and replaceable. Fresh Patch is another such example. Uh, but there, there are really a lot of options in this area. There are a lot of options, and they're inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I saw just a quick Google search for those traction cleats were between 10 and 30 bucks. So oh, yeah. just you know, a very cheap thing to consider, even if it's just for a trial period, you know, look at return policies. If they don't work out, send them back and you're not out anything. Mm -hmm. um, and telework might be, make the most sense depending on the weather in your area absolutely. and the type of job. Um, you know, there's even a place that will help you design an outdoor release area uh, to designate as a service animal release area. That's canine grass. So we talked a little bit about indoor areas, but um, a designated outdoor zone that's designed for that purpose might also be useful in some cases. Right, and I think this is important. Just referencing back to the interactive process, step three, exploring those options. It might not be um, as clear cut whenever you first get this request in, but really kind of thinking outside the box and getting creative with your solutions is what's important. Practical approach, that's the way <laughs> we roll. All right, so looking at uh, sample number two. So in this example, we're talking about a new hire who uses hearing aids. And uh, upon hire, they gave the employer a big long list of telephone access equipment, stuff that their audiologist had actually recommended to them based on their hearing needs and the type of hearing aid that they were using. Uh, and they also happened to mention uh, that in the past they had found a, a private office helpful. Um, I love it when an employee comes in with a list. Right, I always encourage employers to ask individuals, what are your ideas? Because people with disabilities, they might not bring up their ideas unless they're prompted by the employer. So ask them, what have you used in the past? Did you have this problem in your past workplace? You know, what technology did you utilize there? Especially if someone has uh, had a condition for a long time, been in the workforce for a long time, they're likely to know what solutions have worked well for them and which they feel are not even worth trying. Right, just open up that yeah. communication. Right, so in a scenario like this, um, you know, new employee needs telephone access, uh, a lot of times employers will try to just fit them with some noise canceling headphones or an amplified phone, thinking, oh, it's a one size fits all. Uh, it's not, when it comes <laughs> to hearing aids, there is, is no one size fits all solution. It's really good if the person has access to an audiologist and can get that input. Now, having said that, sometimes you can't get everything on the list. <laughs> um, but in this particular case, the employer did arrange for that employee um, to have a telephone captioning service, provided a caption compatible phone, a neck loop, since they did have hearing aids that were telecoil enabled. And uh, this was actually going to be a higher level new hire, uh, someone pretty high in, in an administrative capacity. So uh, the private office was not an issue, often it is. Mm -hmm. um, if it is, there are options though. You can install all types of noise abatement materials in an area to help control that background noise. But gosh, if you have the option for a private office, uh, it's hard to beat, especially if someone has some type of technological issue and they need to go to using a speakerphone for a few days. A private office makes that possible. So pictured we have a captioned phone. This is uh, uh, something that a person can use to access uh, the, the relay service to receive captioning on their phone call. It's just an example. Um, there are captioning services that are offering Cisco compatible services now so that you might be able to use an existing phone in your workplace. Oh, and now we come to the what ifs. 
I'm always telling people not to go down the what-if rabbit hole, but then things come up. (laughs) Employers love hitting us with hypothetical situations. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and then sometimes they come to life. Uh, So we did have a case, a new hire with Bluetooth-enabled hearing aids, uh, was going to start working in a secure facility that prohibited lots of types of wireless devices uh, and, in fact, had a prohibition against Bluetooth-enabled products. Uh, within the workspace itself. Uh, And the employer looked at the devices recommended by the audiologist uh, for use in all kinds of things, face-to-face meetings. I think it was a Roger Penn microphone um, and telephone access, um, the stuff that the audiologist recommended couldn't be used because of the Bluetooth prohibition. Uh, There was even a concern about allowing the hearing aids themselves. These wireless policies have really taken off, wouldn't you say? Oh, my, yes. <clears throat> and it's not just federal sector anymore. I'm seeing it even like in private industry that now employers have this true concrete security policy that they're citing. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's just, I guess, with technology and data these days. Yeah, about five years ago, I could usually talk people around these things. <laughs> uh, but they've really tightened up their policies. And there are good reasons for it. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We need to keep our data secure and, uh, and all of that. But when people go to buy their personal hearing aids, they're usually not thinking that this is going to come up in the workplace, um, you know, unless it's a place that they've worked for a long time. Or they think, oh, the employer will make an exception, right, because it's not like my cell phone. Mm-hmm. But from, from an information data security perspective, the employer might not see a big difference. Um, so one of the first lines of defense here is to see, can you modify the policy and allow this one thing? Uh, and when that works, Great, but we're seeing it work less and less. Wouldn't you agree, Lisa? Absolutely, yeah, Um, because it all goes back to can we modify that company policy for a person with disability absent hardship, but now employers are being able to kind of document it would pose a hardship if we modified it for this hearing aid, for this personal phone, you know, whatever the case may be. I've even had people question whether a telecoil-enabled hearing aid would be allowed in their setting, uh, even though, you know, there's such a short distance that that would actually work. Uh, but, but people do question it sometimes. Uh, that's why I think it's crucial to have IT involved in, in these types of accommodations. So if the policy can be modified, that's great. Let's see, can the policy be modified? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, then here, okay, so we went over policy modification. Now the employee is saying, okay, if you can't modify the policy, what about telework? trying to engage in that interactive process, explore alternative options. Employer denies it because the nature of work, top secret, right? can't leave property. Same Ma- reason we can't use the blue case, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that makes sense. Um, you went over the open cube setting, could pose challenges specifically for an employee who's hard of hearing, who's using different technologies, speakerphone, things like that. Yeah, so this is based on a second very similar example. I probably get these three times a week. Uh, But this employee had to be in an open cubicle setting, but in a secure setting where the hearing aids weren't allowed. Um, That's very, very challenging. Uh, And if you do try to use something like an amplified phone and and see if the person can take their hearing aids out and use that, everybody can hear that amplified phone. And the secret information, not so secret. Right. Um, So in that particular case, the employer wound up working with the audiologist and a hearing aid company uh, just to determine whether there was a hearing aid accessory that would meet their security needs. So at the time that uh, we put these slides together, we hadn't heard back uh, yet for sure what they decided. But I think it's good to take the step. Um, I think it's really good to take the step and try to determine for sure uh, whether there is any way to fit this into your, your policy and your security needs. Uh, And then you can document that you've taken that step as you move on to look for other effective accommodations. You know, like I say, some employers might be okay with using, say, the telecoil setting and a neck loop. Some employers um, have actually moved people into different jobs uh, for for things like this. Uh, Maybe they might move into a position where they can use their Bluetooth-enabled hearing aid because it's outside the secure zone. Right, absolutely. Um, I've even seen cases where new hires, maybe they kind of pivoted and wound up hiring them into a comparable position, but in a different part of the facility. 
Um, but the crucial thing is that they also ask the employee for their ideas on what else might be available to help. Uh, and some employees ask for a lot of things. <laughs> We've had cases where employees ask for sign language classes, um, where the employee asked for a hearing dog. That's a real thing. Uh, there was actually a small business that contacted us, very small, not ADA, very small business. And they actually provided uh, a hearing dog and training on how to work with a hearing dog. This guy was an inspector, worked outdoors, couldn't hear traffic. Um, they called us because the person was obviously taking the dog home at night. It was, you know, their service dog, and one of their family members developed an allergy to it. <laughs> They called us to figure out, well, what can we do now? Uh, do we have to do this under ADA? I'm like, guys are so far beyond ADA, I don't know what to tell you. Right, but, but they're the premier employer but, showing that good faith effort. <laughs> great job taking this practical approach, though. <laughs> and, and we worked through some kenneling options and things like that. But you never know what you're going to get uh, on the sensory team, for sure. Take a case-by-case -case approach. That's my advice. I, I like to think of the employee's suggestions as kind of like a brainstorming session. Don't just reject anything out of hand. Go through the process. Okay. And we've talked again about private offices. If a private office isn't available, noise abatement materials, soundproofing panels, relocating the workspace away from a high traffic area, uh, away from noisy equipment. Um, we had a call once from a lady who had just gotten fitted with hearing aids, and she was so excited. She could hear her coworkers. She could hear the phone. She could hear the cup here all day long. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an easy fix. If you have the space, you can move the person away from that. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about neck loops. Again, sometimes using an alternate technology for telephone access might make the most sense. Um, interestingly, with these security issues, we're also seeing an interest in uh, employers in very secure settings wanting to use shadow interpreters uh, and even uh, in-house cart providers because they just don't trust the technology that you would use to access an interpreter uh, over video or that you might use to access a cart provider. Sometimes they want to be providing those services in the space uh, so that they have more control. It's almost like our culture hasn't caught up to the technology, and now we're going back to some old school stuff. Okay, so looking at example number three, we now have an employee in a correctional facility. They were using pre-filled insulin for diabetes, and um, I do want to make the note that pre-filled insulin pens are different than the typical syringes we think of. So now we have a new ward, warden who showed up and wants to kind of change how things are done, have, put some new policies in place, which we know that's fine with new supervisors, but you do want to be mindful of accommodations and people with disabilities. So this new warden now says, all syringes must stay in your car while you're working on site. Um, but unfortunately, medication can't get too cold, can't get too hot. It must be stored in a temperature-controlled environment to be uh, effective. Extra true for insulin. So now we're looking at a typical approach is to see whether it would be possible to store the pen in a location that's accept acceptable by the employer while also meeting the needs of the employee. Uh, for example, medication could be stored in a locker within the facility but on the outside of the security checkpoint. Uh, we see this in school settings where now teachers will store their medications with the school nurse uh, that's there for the students, but it's creating that secure fa facility while still meeting company policy. And there are storage containers that do exist, but you know, as with anything, those are kind of hard to regulate temperatures and keeping those out uh, in 90 degree sun or you know, in the blizzard, that could still affect the temperature of the medication, which is problematic. I think this call actually came in from Arizona, if I remember correctly. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think it's a great idea to store insulin in a car in that state. Oh, uh, that's, <laughs> I'm sure it got clearly over 100 degrees in Arizona. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know there's so many issues with insulin storage. Uh, we had a case earlier this year where someone's insulin was actually thrown away uh, from the company fridge. They had some type of policy that they were going to clean the fridge on the same day of every month, move your stuff, everyone. 
uh, and he'd been leaving his insulin in the fridge. Someone had said it was okay, uh, and then suddenly someone threw it out. <laughs> that is wild. Yeah, don't don't do that. <laughs> so um, so we got a locker that's on site, but what if it's far away from the individual's workstation? Uh, for medical needs, oftentimes these employees need quick access to their supplies. Uh, perhaps during medical emergencies, they can't walk uh, long distances to get to that locker. They perhaps need other supplies such as monitors, test strips, lancets. Um, there could be a variety of reasons that uh, this locker is an ineffective accommodation. Lots of issues could cause it to be ineffective. Um, and other medical conditions uh, this could be applied to other medical conditions, such as like food allergies, uh, asthma attacks, migraines. So um, thinking how you would apply this policy in these secure facilities uh, to other conditions could be helpful. Oh, absolutely. You know, what we're seeing, especially in the land of diabetes, is that uh, people are using more and more advanced equipment to monitor and manage their condition. And sometimes employers might not be familiar with the new equipment, might not know what it is until the employee says something. Uh, for example, if you've never seen like a Dexcom glucose monitor, you, you might not know what you're looking at. And, and uh, you might be surprised to see it on a person. And someone might not think that, oh, I should request an accommodation to be able to use this in my workplace. Uh, but employers do have concerns, as they do with all Bluetooth devices. There might be um, a security policy issue. It might be quite a rigid policy. Uh, sometimes uh, when it comes to uh, blood sugar monitoring, um, you might have some, some bodily fluids and things that you need to dispose of. Um, so there could be infection control protocols that uh, an employee needs to be aware of if they are testing at work. Um, sometimes an employee might be using something like a continuous glucose uh, monitor, but they don't have a lot of effective alternatives that they could use instead to monitor their condition. And we get employers sometimes who really want to get into the employee's medical business and say, well, don't use that. Uh, just test every 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, and without any idea not being the person's, you know, treating medical provider, whether that's going to work for them. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to add is not only talking about wearables, but sometimes it's just utilizing apps on um, devices. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so looking at your policy, and is it problematic because this person is trying to utilize an app on their personal device? So as an accommodation, could we permit them to use a company-owned device and access that app? And would that kind of overcome that um, policy that you're citing? and work for both parties. Absolutely. And sometimes the medical device company might have a non-app option uh, for accessing that. So, for instance, some of the continuous glucose monitoring companies uh, provide another option instead of the app, uh, and it's aimed at customers who might not have a smartphone. But mm -hmm. could it be useful in this type of setting? Sure, maybe. Right, right. So get creative uh, with these requests and kind of whenever you're engaging. Yeah. So there can be a lot of options. Uh, one of my favorites is the plan of action. I don't know, do you do a lot of plan of action uh, related accommodations on the motor team? Oh, I'm always citing the plan of action. Um, Jan does have a sample one on the website, but really you want to talk about a plan of action before the need arises, because <laughs> that's when it's most beneficial for all parties. So really documenting who's going to do what in case of emergency and what next steps are, um, and really tailoring it to the employee. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all for plan of action by any means. Yeah, and I think it needs to be reviewed. Periodically, absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, some people are not going to need 911 called. It might just need to be, you know, contact a friend or family member to come pick them up from work. It may just need 15 minutes to kind of reset, reorient, and get back to work. It's not as serious as an employer may perceive, you know, visually. So really kind of just talking to the employee, what do you need? Um, did you have an example on Dexcom? 
Well, you know, we did have a case, and it was actually the first time the Dexcom came to my attention. Um, there was a new employee in a federal setting. Uh, they had just been hired, came to work on their very first day, and they were wearing their Dexcom to monitor their glucose. Uh, why? Well, they had a very brittle version of diabetes. Their blood sugar would go up and down very quickly, and they would need to be alerted so that they could take action quickly and stay healthy. Uh, but as they were coming into this you know, big orientation training, uh, someone noticed what they were wearing, asked what it was. Uh, not an HR person, not somebody who knew about diabetes, uh, just someone who was you know, working the event. And they said, take it off. You can't have that here. Uh, and the person did. And um, they had an episode because their blood sugar went out of range. Uh, and when I heard that, I was like, Who, whose idea was this? Um, it might have made a lot more sense to um, like step back, see if the person maybe could um, take leave for the rest of that day while you're figuring it out. But never would I ever tell someone to take off their medical equipment. Uh, That's traumatizing. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I had secondary trauma from taking that call, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. But there's certainly, it makes sense to plan ahead so that whoever's in charge of enforcing your rules for, for new hires, your rules at training events, um, has a protocol. Uh, and that's probably not your best protocol. <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> so, yeah, circling back to other options to consider, I talked about plan of action. Um, a simple solution, someone else retrieving those supplies. But again, that's probably going to be designated in that plan of action that your cube mate, Susie, is going to run and go get your monitor from the locker and bring it back to you if you can't walk in case of emergency. Um, so really getting those details down on the plan of action. And then, of course, you know, if you're using a medical device, consult the manufacturer, seek input from the individual and their physician. So again, going back to gathering relevant information to make an informed accommodation decision. Yeah, and there are lots of good reasons why you might want somebody to use a, like a secure container when they're carrying their, their medication or their testing equipment. Um, we've had cases where maybe camp, camp counselors might need to carry injectable medication, and you don't want little kids to get their hands on that. Um, but if you look around, there's usually an option. I think in that case, we actually found a, a flocking fanny pack uh, for the camp counselor to wear. So I agree with you, Lisa. There are lots of options, and it's good to keep an open mind and focus on that plan of action as your guide. Oh, now we want to talk about service animals again. We get so many service animal calls on the sensory team. Um, and I've had calls a lot of times where an HR person or a coworker or a supervisor, maybe the employee, uh, is like, well, I, I want to bring my service dog, but there's a no pet policy. Um, what can I do? Uh, and under Title I of the ADA, essentially policies related to service animals are no animal policies. And it's often possible to modify those to permit a service animal that's needed due to disability. So. The short answer is, if you have a no pet policy, a service animal is not a pet. An emotional support animal is not a pet either. Um, these animals have a purpose. So let's see if we can modify the policy. Is there any practical way of doing that? Uh, but sometimes there's a concern because someone in the work environment might already have this closed, say, a dog allergy or an allergy to another type of animal, because lots of different types of animals can, can be service animals under the ADA. And uh, sometimes people will say, well, they have to work closely together. Um, this person supervises the other, but there's usually a workaround. Now, we got a case not long ago that I never thought we would get, um, where the CEO of a company was allergic to the service animal that the new hire wanted to bring into the building. So someone from the HR department contacted us uh, to learn about how to modify a policy to allow a service animal. 
Uh, and they said, well, there's, there's a twist. Um, this person is somebody pretty high up in the company. Well, I've heard this before. I was like, oh, who is it, the CEO? And she's like, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this person felt that they could be caught uh, in a little bit of a power struggle uh, between someone who was really motivated to avoid dogs for obvious reasons and someone who really probably needed to have their animal in the workplace. So we talked a little bit about modifying policies, but um, we also, luckily, on the JAN website, have an article about how to balance the needs of someone who has an allergy with the needs of a service animal user. And I think it's important to think about the type of work that the two people are doing, the areas where they would typically work, because it's probably not as difficult to balance the needs as you might think. Um, they might not even be in the same part of the employer's campus most of the time. Um, so one strategy that people will use is to eliminate or reduce in-person contact. So let's try not to have these two people in the same room, because even if the animal isn't with the service animal user, um, there could still be like dander on their clothing. Um, if there is a time when they need to be in the same place at the same time, well, then let's not meet at the desk of the employee who uses the animal. Let's maybe meet in a more neutral location, maybe a place that um, has been carefully cleaned, maybe with an air purifier. Um, there's just lots of things that we can do. We might even have separate paths of travel to places like the restroom and common areas like a break room uh, or a conference room. Another thing that can be done is you can consider offering dander management products to the employee who wants to bring their service animal to work. Um, there are a variety of soaps, shampoos, and wipes and various things um, that can be used to reduce the impact of the animal's dander on someone who may be allergic. Uh, there are also a lot of carpet shampoos uh, and other types of cleaning products specifically for this exact problem. So I always say before you push the panic button, look at your options. Right. And from an ADA standpoint, taking a step back and assessing, you're really just opening up two simultaneous interactive processes. We have the CEO mm -hmm. who's allergic with the new versus the new hire with the dog. And so really kind of just seeing what their needs are and kind of assessing those. Um, and I know it's a CEO, and I know that's stressful, but treat it as you would any other request. And don't get all shook by, you know, from who it's requested by. Um, but just, you know, assess it with a case-by-case -case basis and case-by-case -case determination. As we say, stick with the interactive process. Just go through the steps, document everything that you've considered, uh, document if you need to reject something, why. Just stay on the path, and things will probably be okay. Absolutely. So I know we kind of glazed over it, but long and the short of it, the employer did learn about ADA requirements and modified their no animal policy. And ADA requirements uh, under Title I, I mean, there is no definition of service animal for employment settings. That's right. So we might be considering, you know, various. Well, a lot of employers are under the impression that they don't have to permit, say, an emotional support animal because the rules for Title II and III in public access spaces, those are different. Mm -hmm. um, but because the information that we have from the EEOC is, is more vague, then it's something that an employer might have to consider uh, because it's not automatically restricted the way it is under other titles. Um, similarly, um, animals that might be supporting someone in the workplace uh, don't have to be restricted to um, miniature horses and dogs. Uh, we've had... Um, questions about lots of types of animals, uh, birds. Uh, I was on the road once and somebody asked me about a hearing cat. Uh, th these things come up. Mm -hmm. uh, and for emotional support, almost any animal mm -hmm. uh, might serve as an emotional support. Right. And I think, you know, not just scoffing that off by that request, but really engaging the interactive process and see if it, just like you would choose any accommodation, if you can, you know, consider the service animal. And real quick, I feel like we have to mention documentation issues where there isn't a true certification for service animal under Title I. There, there's, of course, you can get on websites and print out documents, but really for practical guidance in the workplace is going to be the demonstration periods and trial periods. Can that animal uh, behave appropriately in the work environment? 
from a practical standpoint, that's how you're going to know if it can work or not. But employers get caught up in all types of you know, convoluted thinking on this issue. Uh, for example, one time uh, we had someone who, whose supervisor was insisting they must bring in the animal service animal certificate or it was not legal. Uh, and then uh, finally the person did. And another higher up in the workplace wanted to come down on the person for essentially lying <laughs> and just buying a certificate off of the Internet. Well, that, that poor person was just trying to do what everybody wanted and make everybody happy. Right, right. And, I mean, whenever we talk about medical documentation, you know, the doctor's notes, a lot of times physicians aren't included in the acquisition of these animals, so their notes aren't going to weigh in on the service animal aspect of it. Um, so, again, we just kind of recommend those trial periods, bring the dog in for a small window of time and see if it tolerates the work environment. Yeah, it might not be a physician. It might be an OT, a vision rehabilitation therapist, a rehab counselor. Um, I think two people get caught up on this issue of notes having to come from MDs. They don't mm -hmm. always have to, per the guidance. Right. And we have a whole publication on service animals on the website um, here on slide 22. I know we linked the allergy service animal publication, but we have a couple on service animals, so definitely take a look and poke around because there's a lot of information about service animals and the differences between Title I and public access. Um, but, of course, you know, reach out with any questions if you want to talk through a situation. Okay, moving on to the next example. <clears throat> uh, here we have a, uh, an employee with a foot impairment who uses a cane uh, for mobility. The employer wants them to utilize an evacuation chair during drills and in case of emergencies. The person with a disability has some reservations. Uh, evacuation chairs are a two-man job. You have the person with a disability who's physically in the evacuation chair and someone who is maneuvering that down the staircase. So this person with a disability has some reservations about their coworkers and colleagues carrying them down the staircase uh, in this chair. So the employee, their preference of an accommodation is to stand in a fireproof hall. So looking at a typical solution, um, in this case, the employer did call their local fire marshal, which I was pleasantly surprised because they're the professionals. So we'll talk to everybody all the time, but, you know, there are some people who have more expertise in fire evacuation than us as Jan Consultant. So contact the professional, get their uh, information. A lot of times local fire stations will come out to your site and kind of develop a plan of action and evacuation uh, plan for you. So utilize those resources. Um, so they did contact the local fire marshal uh, and they, the marshal did determine standing in that fireproof hall is not going to be deemed safe in, uh, in case of a fire emergency. So of course you want to remember the ADA rules. You want to consider the employee's preference. Um, and you do want to uh, be mindful of dignity issues. You know, if I wouldn't want my coworker carrying me down. That's going to, um, it could be embarrassing. Uh, what if they drop me? That could, I could get more hurt. There could be a lot of issues. Um, but ultimately, under ADA, the employer does choose an effective, among effective options. So the ultimate goal is everyone evacuating safely. So looking at alternative ideas, of course, you know, relocating the workstation, moving people down to the first floor. Uh, a lot of times employers work uh, team, they want their team to stay together so we can't move someone down to the first floor. But in this day and age with technology, conference calls, Skype, you know, I, I don't think that holds as much weight as it used to. There's a lot of technology and remote conferencing in, so consider alternative workstations. Um, alternative drills, can the in individuals with a disability verbally uh, explain how they would get out in case of emergency? They might not want to put themselves at risk for a drill in case of emergency, they'll do it. So if they can just kind of talk you through what their plan is, that could uh, be feasible. Of course, you want to train coworkers on using those ch evacuation chairs perhaps using a dummy who similar weight and height as the person with disability to really mirror an emergency. Uh, we went over plan of action that uh, is linked on slide 19. And then I mentioned talk to the professionals. 
yeah, the person's physical therapist, for instance, must have, might have some really great ideas on how they could get down safely without the chair, for instance. I, right. I think conferring with medical professionals who are familiar with the employee can be just so useful, no matter what the situation. Okay. So that's the end of the situation solution portion of our presentation today, but we really just wanted to emphasize to stay calm and focus on um, one accommodation request at a time and kind of navigate through these waters. I, we know it can be overwhelming at times, but really kind of breaking it down, seeing what the employee needs versus the employer's um, intentions and business needs and really kind of bridging that gap. So you don't want to forget to do your case-by-case -case determinations. You don't want to forget to apply your policies in a non-discriminatory manner, apply those policies uniformly, but always consider modifications absent undue hardship. And it's just keeping the framework of the interactive process in the background. Absolutely. As long as you are following the steps, doing your documentation, you've got a framework to go on, and you'll be able to explain why you made the decisions that you made. Yeah, document all employment decisions. Um, paper trails are good for everybody. Yeah, and remember that exploring accommodation options is, is part of the interactive process. It's okay to try to sort out what else might work. So we'd like to take a few minutes here toward the end to tell you about some new solutions for problems that you may have encountered. Um, there have been some exciting technological developments. You'll, if you're you know, frequent listeners, you know how much Lisa and I love to talk about tech. Um, so on the e-reader front, there's actually an exciting new product uh, from American Thermoform. It is a multi-line digital Braille e-reader. Uh, and, and what it's for is for someone who uses Braille and might need to access uh, e-books or other documents that could be turned into e-book format uh, on the job. They can read multiple lines. Um, so they can access that ebook more quickly and efficiently. Um, the Kindle Oasis has also um, been updated, and there are some new ways to listen uh, to materials on that in an accessible way, uh, but it does require that you actually Bluetooth to the device in order to get that audio output. Um, I told you earlier we had a call about a service cat. Um, Cat allergies, of course, are very common, but there is a potential solution on the horizon, the HypoPet AG vaccine, which is actually a shot to be given to a cat to um, make their dander less bothersome to persons with cat allergies. So this is exciting and new. Uh, and uh, Molecule, if you've been following their air purifiers, they make very high-end, very expensive air purifiers. They've come out with a mini model. It actually has a little carrying strap on it. Uh, it's pricey. It's uh, just under $350. But if you've been looking into those, but you need something more portable or for a more, uh, you know, modest size space, that might be an option. Uh, a question we get all the time also is, uh, what if you need to use a cordless phone with a hearing aid? Uh, this comes up a lot in food service settings. Maybe they, everybody in the uh, facility customarily takes calls on the cordless phone. Uh, in the past, we've been looking at job restructuring so that the person wouldn't have to take those calls, but Phonak has come out with the DECT phone, that's D-E-C-T. It transmits calls to hearing aids, uh, but it also serves as a standard cordless phone so that your coworkers who do not use hearing aids can also take calls on it. Very exciting development from Phonak. And then, Lisa, I think you wanted to talk about the vibrating mat. Right. So oftentimes, I was just talking to management today about what motor team takes calls in day in and day out, and that's still the stand, uh, sit-stand workstation. So more and more of us are standing up for our work days, which is uh, great. But for looking at anti-fatigue mats, uh, they're getting fancier, making some uh, vast improvements in the old 3x3 three -three black foam mat. So here on the left, we have, um, and these are both by Foam Era. The left is um, has massage heads and rollers that you can kind of switch out, and that's at $85. And then the right, the picture on the right, is an electric mat that has toe-touch activation for the vibrating features. 
So I think that could be good for standing limitations, neuropathy, um, all types of issues for those of us. And even if it's not at a uh, sit-stand workstation, if we're just having to stand at a production belt all day, I could see the benefits of the, something like this. Oh, absolutely. And the price point is very friendly. Oh, for sure. Under 100 bucks for both of them. Oh, yeah. So uh, what's new in automated captioning? Uh, if you've been listening to me for a long time, you know I talk a lot about uh, automated captioning products, including the InterpreType. The InterpreType has been recently updated, and they now use a cloud-based product for their transcription. Um, what we're hearing uh, from the folks at InterpreType is this change was made for increased accuracy um, so that you don't have to uh, train individual voices on the InterpreType anymore. This should pick up voices without training. So it's very exciting. The AVA app is now offering business pricing for inclusive organizations and events. You know, in the past, we've talked a lot about people using the free option. You get so many hours of captioning on the AVA app for free. AVA is an app that will caption a conversation um, live, uh, but they're now offering uh, captioning that works more similarly uh, to what a cart transcriptionist might provide. Uh, and we've talked also about the, the Kindle. I think I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, the PageBot, which I used to love for turning pages independently on um, the old Kindle keyboard, uh, it's been discontinued. We, we can't get that anymore. Um, touch screens are just uh, coming into much more wide use. But uh, Kindle has improved the voice view. They've got inverted display options uh, and even improved interoperability with the NVDA and Braille displays. So lots of exciting updates. Uh, here's an update that, I, that I'm actually very excited about uh, for those STEM settings. Uh, Independent Science has updated their Talking Lab Quest. They now have the Talking Lab Quest 2. Uh, what this is for is to render uh, various types of lab experiments and tasks accessible to a person with a vision impairment. Um, what you see here in the picture is a probe um, that can be used to detect various things, let somebody know um, how, for instance, their chemical reaction might be progressing. Independent science also offers a variety of related equipment, uh, including some things like um, printers that can produce accessible documents, uh, lots of exciting things from independent science. But the Talking Lab Quest 2 is one that I'm looking forward to seeing at my next AT conference. <laughs> Now, this, this is something that uh, Lisa put in here because she knew I could fill up any number of minutes at the end of the presentation. What we have here uh, is an example of uh, a type of headset that might be used for brain-computer interface research. Uh, around the country, there are various uh, places doing neuroscience research, especially on how to interact with a computer using your brain waves. Uh, and the idea is a person might uh, wear uh, some type of cap or helmet that connects electrodes to their skin at various points around their head. Uh, and these would measure brainwave activity and allow a person to do tasks such as turning things on and off or even typing um, essentially with their brainwaves. Uh, so how this can be used in the workplace, you might ask, it's already being used by some individuals uh, with, for instance, ALS, who uh, need to uh, work from home, but can do things like email, supervise a team, manage schedules, et cetera, uh, via a computer using the right technology. Who might use this type of thing? Well, the idea is that this is an option for people for whom eye gaze has become um, too slow, too cumbersome, or just ineffective due to accuracy. They could tr possibly transition to using uh, a brain computer interface to access their computer. But there, there are people who are using this now, but it's not something you can buy off the shelf. Um, <clears throat> you would go through someone who's doing research in this area. Uh, but ALS and uh, complex cerebral palsy, those are some examples of conditions um, that uh, people who are researching in this area are, are looking for clients to do, do testing. Exciting stuff on the AT front. 
Okay, so of course you can reach us 9 to 6 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the number again is 800-526-7234. You can send us an email at jan at askjan.org if you have specifics, or of course the chat on askjan.org. Now we do have a couple minutes, so we are going to get to some questions we received. Um, this one is about a service dog in um, the food service industry worried about health inspections. Is there any like formal guidance that you want to weigh in on, Teresa? I'm so glad you asked. In <laughs> fact, there is. <laughs> um, on the JAN website, you can find a number of EEOC guidance documents, including one that addresses accommodation needs in food service settings. Uh, and there are rules about um, in a food service setting where an animal may and may not go. So uh, one typical way to handle something like this is the person might use their service animal to commute to and from work. Uh, maybe even to access certain parts of the facility, but they would not typically be in the food prep area, and there are rules for um, when you need to wash your hands, so obviously after handling the animal, before handling food, uh, but that's all laid out in a guidance document. Great question. Can you provide the product information for dander control items? Um, Aller Pet is one brand uh, that's pretty well known. There are others. Um, but if you uh, happen to find yourself on the JAN website, we do have information on all those vendors of which we are aware. A lot of people start with Amazon, just as an example. Um, but um, the Aller Pet brand is one that we've had some, some input on, good feedback. Okay. Uh, what is the reference to the EEOC guidance on the landlord interference? Um, this is linked on our website, or you could just Google EEOC guidance, reasonable accommodation, and the undue hardship under the ADA. It's number 46. It kind of talks about making accommodations uh, to property owned by someone else, and it goes into the nitty-gritty details um, about shared obligations and uh, lease, leases and contracts, and that and landlords shouldn't be interfering with an employer's obligation to accommodate. And so um, an employer can't claim hardship just because a landlord doesn't want something right off the bat. Yeah, it doesn't mean you can always provide the exact accommodation requested, but there's protocol for um, making sure that you at least make an attempt to work things out, right? Exactly. Um, do you have insight on who pays for indoor relief areas and those dander cleaning products? You know, this is a question that we get all the time, and the truth is we don't have formal guidance uh, on this specifically because the EEOC hasn't put a lot in writing about service animals. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, if an employer is insisting on a particular option, uh, I think it makes sense that the employee might be hoping they would pay for it. Uh, and with the, the dander control products particularly, um, there might need to be um, a voluntary element there because these might be things that the employee is using at home when they bathe the animal and not at the work environment. Okay. Um, where can employees go to find out more about accommodation ideas based on their specific need? Well, that's on the JAN website, of course. We have, um, at JAN.org, we have A to Z lists by disability, by limitation, by work-related function. Uh, you can find lots of information there on accommodation ideas and vendor lists for different products that we might uh, uh, provide as an idea. And then, Teresa, what AT conferences do you recommend? Well, you know how much I love <laughs> ATIA, uh, which is coming up in, at the end of January this year. What's that stand for? Uh, Assistive Assistive Technology no. Industry Association. Wonderful conference. Very... Uh, very friendly and also uh, very beginner friendly. There's a wonderful culture there for teaching people who may be new to the assistive technology world. Another one that I love, and I know you too uh, love it, Lisa, is the CSUN conference uh, in California. Yeah, those are two good ones uh, for any interest in assistive technology. But there are a lot of regional events, too, and you can always reach out to your state AT project to see about some customized local training. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and that is all the time we have today. So if you need additional information or want to discuss an accommodation or ADA issue, please feel free to contact us. We thank you for attending, and thank you also to Alternative Communication Services for providing the net captioning. We hope the program was useful. 
As mentioned earlier, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window as soon as we're finished. We appreciate your feedback, so please hope you take a moment to fill out the form. This concludes today's webcast.